Hi folks, welcome to Last Day's Live. Sorry about that. I'm like, what, five minutes late? Had some technical difficulties. It's a pain, but uh, I'm just not the sharpest knife in the drawer. And uh, without my wife, I got problems. She spent a lot of time helping me try to get a video together so I could show you off of Facebook. And I got out here in my office and uh, it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> ah, so you know what I'm gonna do with this? In the past, I just it just oh it would just you know, but I'm not doing that anymore. No you know what I think I'm gonna do about this? I'm just gonna assume that God did not want me to necessarily show it right here, uh, and so that that's fine. I'm gonna allude to it, but it's gonna kind of make my uh, last day's live current event uh, a little bit lame because I can't show it to you. But anyhow, here we are, folks. Remember. It's happening right before our eyes. This is the thing that I just don't really get with church leaders and and others today. Is uh, we're seeing the we're seeing the the persecution come down upon us. We're we're seeing the circle tighten around the church. Uh, within within the just the last two decades, we've seen the Islamic population as it has just you know it's it's, it's just continued to grow exponentially. Our last president, President Obama, I am convinced that he intentionally took a bunch of, of Somalis and, and Islamic people and put them in Minnesota in a particular district so that he knew that it would just be a short amount of time before that they could take over the electorate in that area and they could elect people who are going to be serving in Washington. And we presently have those folks who are serving in Washington. We, we've got folks in Washington serving over us who are not just atheists. They're worshiping a foreign god. We're, we're living in tough times. It's happening right before our eyes. And, and let me go beyond that. You know, what about what's happening just as far as your local culture is concerned? Can you honestly say that things are getting better? You're, you're you know, 10 years ago you went to Walmart. All right, now let's compare that journey to Walmart to what happened uh, 10 years ago compared to what happened today. Uh, it, would you say that there's anything different? Do people act different? Would you say young people are uniquely different in, in the way that they approach uh whatever it may be, our culture is going crazy. It's going nuts. You, you, you don't really even have to look at the news. Just kind of look out your front window and you begin to see that people are, are afraid, people are concerned, etc. It's happening right before our eyes. And my question is, how in the world can we as church leaders not address what's going on? When in the world does it become crunch time? When do we, I made this statement or comparison recently, and I think it's, it's legit. If you were to take your congregation and divide them into two groups, how many people would be in the group that looks pretty much like the world? And how many people would be in the group that looks like Noah's family, building a boat out back and, <laughs> you know, what in the world? Constantly talking about end time stuff, like, come on, which of the two groups would they be in? And it, it just seems nonsensical to me that if you're a church leader, that, that you would be an individual who would recognize the signs of the times and realize that as an individual who's responsible for God's people, that we would step up and we would do something big in a big way to make sure that, you know, it, but it seems that those individuals, that they get their ears tied back and, 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 and they, they, they get all kinds of persecution and most of them fold. I haven't folded yet and boy, has it brought the pressure down upon my family. Oh, man. Well, this is where I was supposed to take you to current events. Now, in the current events, you are going to watch this video that I can't make happen. But uh, in this video, this guy presents such a crazy cool um, discussion. It's actually, and I'm not, I, I, it's in a state legislature uh, assembly kind of a thing. And what I'm going to ask you to do is pedal backwards in my feed and, and you'll, you'll see this guy as he just tears apart the liberal democratic party and talks about how uncivil they are they won't even talk about various issues when they do their they they accuse the, the conservatives of being nazis they oh, it's just a powerful powerful video that i just wish desperately that i could have shown you tonight but i can't so what do you do except be frustrated and i told you i'm not going to do that right okay so we're I need you to look back at that current event because this is major to our time together on Monday nights. And if I can't have a current event, I'm not really sure why we're doing it because that was the point <laughs> at the front end, right? You know, that it's happening right before our eyes. Segment one, current event. I need you to watch that little video, uh, please. And uh, as, that, as this thing goes up as a recording, I'll try to tag it 
so that you can you can get to it easily. But uh, wow, talk about a powerful, powerful video. Well, since I can't do a current event in that manner, I'll tell you about what happened yesterday. Cindy and I went to hear my oldest son, Bryson, preach, and boy, did he do a phenomenal job. He uh, He's big into visual aids, and he did something that I had heard of before, even been in some smaller devotionals and seen it happen, but it was amazing, this congregation of 200 plus, and uh, he had all the lights turned out, and uh, he preached his sermon, almost the entire sermon, by candlelight, one single candle at the front of the, of, uh, at the, front of the auditorium, but... Um, towards the end, he was trying to make the point about how we need to be the light of the world and yet at the same time recognize that your one little light has power. And uh, so, as he concluded, he, he talked about how that it's uh, contagious and how that fire, uh, it, it, wants to, it wants to join with other elements of fire and, and, and to build and to grow. And so, he took his one candle that was on the pulpit and he lit another little candle, and then he had his youth group, some guys from his youth group, and they took that little candle and lit another one and another one, and around the room they went. I wish you could have seen it. It was it was dark in there when he started his sermon, except for the focal point, which was the ser- which was the pulpit, and then these these little candles, little tiny lights, they began to light up, and by the time it was done, you could see all the way across the auditorium. It was almost like the lights had come back on. It was amazing what happened. I was so thankful to be a part of that. That, uh, that time with my son. And one of the things that really meant the world to Cindy and I, and we cried through the whole service, but we, it was, you know, how important it is for one little light to shine. This is the light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. Are you really? Are you really? Or are you going to cave? At the first time somebody says, oh, you can't do that because oh, that's, that's a little controversial. We need to move aside here in the closet and let's talk about it over here. Are you going to cave? Or are you going to let your light shine? Are you going to hide it under your bushel? Or you're going to let your light shine. It's time, if it's the last days, it's time for somebody to let their light shine. And to do it boldly and without apologies. And to say those things that are blunt if necessary. If that's what it's got to take in order for you to get your attention, then I'm going to follow the path of Jesus when he goes in and flips over tables. I'm going to follow the path of Paul when he writes in a letter that later will be read among the churches and is preserved for us some 2,000 years old. 2,000 years later, he writes that some of these false teachers, I wish they'd just go and cut stuff off, emasculate themselves. Because he was making a point. People aren't hearing, so what do you do? You scream a little louder. And when the raindrops start falling, you ask yourself, why in the world, folks? I realize I look like an idiot building a big boat in my backyard, but look, I've only got eight folks to show for it. It's last days, folks. It's time to man up. And it's time for the church to recognize how important it is for us to stop playing like the best approach for us as far as winning the world is for us to constantly go around in some apologetic mode, doing the, the weak, timidity kind of approach, and recognize that if there's anything that Jesus wanted to leave with us, it is that I leave you with power. And given that power, I expect you to exercise it. And I'm just concerned that we're not exercising the power. All right, current event. Sorry I couldn't show you that little video. I hope you really will pedal down. You'll see it. It was powerful. It was really powerful. All right, applications for Christians. If you had watched the video, my application was going to be this. We live in an uncivil and completely unreliable political climate. Therefore, keep your family close. We, we live in dangerous times. We live in difficult times. And what I'm finding is that most Christians would rather hide in a cave. Most Christians are slinking to the backdrop. They're either compromising their convictions and being just like the world, or they're just holding back their convictions and not talking about it in front of the world because they're afraid of the persecution that's coming. Listen, I do not want my family to suffer. But I don't want my family to go to hell either. Which is more important? We know that when the Lord comes, he's coming for the remnant. And the remnant is always much smaller than what people assume it should be. Nobody would have guessed in the time of Noah there was just going to be eight of them. Nobody. You want to be part of the remnant? You got to man up. You want to be part of those who survive this thing in the presence of the Lord? You got to put your, you got to put your faith where your promise was made years ago. You remember that moment? You stood before that audience in that, that baptistry. You remember? And you, you were asked. 
to give the great... Do you accept Jesus as your Lord? Did you? Did you? Did you count on... Did you really count the cost? Did you recognize that in the process you might have to lose some friends along the way? You might have to make some choices that are inconvenient along the way. You might have to give up a career along the way in order for you... Did you mean that promise? And when Romans 12, 1 and 2 is talked about with regards to living, being a living sacrifice, are, are you that? Aren't, we are begging people just to show up one time a week at church. I, I just can't see. How do we not say we're losing 70% of our young people to the world upon graduation from high school? The majority of them are walking away. Most of them never coming back. How do we not see what's happening in our culture? And here's the point. Do something about it. Why persecute the ones who are at least suggesting that we had do something, go in a different direction? And yet it seems like that's where we are in the church today. Last day's biblical warning. Uh, I want to take you to a passage that's been on my heart. I, I, I spoke about it um, recently, but uh, this, this particular passage is amazing to me. Let's see if I can get that glare off of there for you. What am I going to do here? Uh, that didn't help. Oh, I wanted you to be able to see that. And is that any better at all? Oh, I know why that... that that verse 3, that's supposed to be in red, and you can't see it, can you? Anyway, the most important line, and you can't see it, but that's okay. I'll read it to you. This passage from 2 Timothy chapter 4, and again, you know, 2 Timothy chapter 3, he talks about the, the, the idea of the last days. I use that all the time, and also 2 Peter chapter 3. Um, so if you're trying to remember where the last days phraseology comes from, it's in chapter 3, chapter, chapter 3, 1 Peter and, or excuse me, 2 Peter and 2 Timothy. Anyhow, uh, but in this passage, notice what it says. Paul, writing to the young man Timothy, and he is saying, saying the seasoned veteran is saying to the young man Timothy, here's what you got to do. Preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. We are there, my friends. We are there. Let's pick that apart just for a, a couple seconds here uh, this evening. Notice he says, Timothy, you need to preach the word. It's interesting. He didn't say preach your opinion. He didn't, he didn't say you need to cave to social norms. He didn't say you should judge all the things that you're going to say by whether or not it's going to be popular. He said you need to preach the word. He also said you need to be pre prepared to preach that word, whether it's in season or out of season, <laughs> whether people want to hear it or not. Whether it's something that uh, you know that, that seems to, to, to fit the moment, or you, you got to be ready to preach it. But then there is this part where he says, this stuff that you're supposed to preach, it needs to be used for correction, rebuking, encouraging. But then watch this. He says that we need, as preachers, as Christians, but certainly individuals like myself who are constantly under ridicule because we're speaking out about things, we have to do it with great patience. Everybody takes that term and, and turns it into a sissy word. Everybody takes that term and suggests you, and well, that means that if anything starts to look like we're, we might be in a debate, then I'm just going to back off and I'm going to say, it's okay. Or I'm going to take it to the corner. Or I'm going to hide in the shadows. No, that's not what Jesus did. Jesus regularly was in debate. Paul was regularly in debate. Jesus was forever in public discussions that ended up being debates. He didn't say, hey, let's just move this to the corner here. He would sit at Simon's dinner table and, she, and, and here this woman is, a sinful woman, is washing his feet and him calls Simon out because he's having bad thoughts, had bad motives. He calls him at his own table. We've got to do it with great patience, but I think that word patience is more for the speaker than it is for the people he's speaking to. I think he's saying to Timothy, you need to be an individual who has great endurance. You see, that's another word that could be, it could be the, the, the Greek could be translated into here. Do it with great endurance. I say patience and everybody gets all weenie on us. I think what he's saying here is, no, you have got to hang in there. Don't give up. I spoke to a preacher, a text message, a good friend of mine, who just, just today told me, he said, I'm just so fed up and I'm ready to quit. And I said, please, I need you. Don't give up. That's what he's saying to the young man, Timothy, here. He says, you need to do it with great patience. And then he says also, as we add to it, it's not just great patience, but we also need to be careful. You can't really see that. I'm sorry, that line, but I circled the word careful there. It's specifically careful instruction. I'd like for you to tie the word careful here to this word, word up here. 
I think what he is saying is that we need to be careful that we preach the word. Meaning that whatever you preach, especially if you're going to have to correct and rebuke, etc., make sure that it is Bible-based. And this is what I just boggles my mind recently. If you see my posts, they are filled with scripture. If you watch my original memes or things that I originally post, I'm going to post something that's going to prompt probably discussion, maybe even controversy. Then somebody is most likely going to challenge me on it. And they're going to say, oh, but Sonny. And they might even, they even might start the conversation off with their claws out. I've had that recently happen to me. What do you do in those situations? Well, I'll tell you, I'm not going to be the, t the timid preachers that we've so often had in the past. I'm going to be a Paul. I'm going to be a Jesus. You're going to challenge me? I'm coming right back at you, but I'm coming back at you just like Jesus would did with Satan. I'm going to come back at you with passages of Scripture. The Word says. I think that's what he's saying here to Timothy. He's saying, Timothy, you need to be careful when you preach with great patience. Be careful that you are preaching the Word. He also says <coughs> that there's a time that's coming when people will not put up with sound doctrine. I think we're smack dab in the middle of it. You know, Titus chapter 2 and verse 5, interesting passage. I've got myself in deep, deep water over this one in the past. But in that passage, he specifically says that older women should teach younger women how to be homemakers, among other things. Of course, you're not allowed to say that in today's world. But um, the reason this is a, such a very, very powerful passage is because what Paul goes on to say to Titus. He goes on to say at the end of verse 5, the reason that young ladies need to be taught to be homemakers, respect their husband, love their children, all, 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 all. the reason that needs to be is so that the word of God, NIV says, will not be maligned. King James says, blasphemed. I asked you a question. Is the word of God being maligned and blasphemed in our culture today? I think so. Is it possible then we could re... What's the word? Uh, Re-engineer? Or, re, or, or, or do the equation backwards? God's word is being blasphemed, therefore some things are not happening. Specifically, our young women are not being taught to be homemakers. And when the home starts to fall apart, what happens? When the home falls apart, the church is going to fall apart. When the church falls apart, the community is going to fall apart. When the community falls apart, the, the entire culture is going to fall apart. That's where we are today. And he is saying there's coming a time, we're in it, when folks are not going to put up with sound doctrine. They're just not going to put up with it. And man, am I seeing that. I found it interesting over the last two years. Over the last two years, I have preached and posted, and I have been just tirelessly relentless on the subject of Islam. And I'm a hero when I do it. I have preached tirelessly, and I've posted relentlessly on the subject of Calvinism. And for those of us who are Restoration Christians and believe in the power of baptism, I was a hero. But the moment I, James chapter 1 turn the mirror and make it look in the face of the church. And the church has to look at themselves in the mirror. And I suggest to you that our desertion rate with regards to our young people is directly connected to the fact that our family is falling apart. And the reason our family is falling apart is because we're sending our kids away for 50% of their waking hours into the tutelage of the world. And it's no wonder they're coming home with an entirely different value system than what we're trying to give them in the few hours that we have at home. And I say that and all of a sudden I'm, in, I'm the enemy. I'm allowed to talk about Islam. I'm allowed to talk about Calvinism. As long as it's somebody else, son, get after that, and boy, we're going to give you high fives, and you're the champion. But the moment I make us, the church, look in the mirror, I become the enemy. Some dearest friends that I've had, some of my dearest friends in life, have just been horribly abusive recently with regards, because I'm speaking out on a subject matter that I am absolutely convinced will turn this crazy culture around. If we will reclaim dominance over our children, and the training process, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. If we will reclaim the training process of our children, we can reverse this thing. But if we don't, we will never have the blessing of God. But I'm the enemy, because there are so many who will not put up with sound doctrine today. They'd much rather, they'd much rather that I just keep my mouth shut, that I just tone it down, that I just move on to another subject. I said it this morning, I'm going to say it to you because it's important for you, especially during this time, to know it. I don't change the channel. I can't tell you the number of people who have recently said, Sonny, can't you move on to another topic? Most of them said it in a nasty way, but that was the point. Can't you just move on? I'm tired of this one. Can't you just move on? You need to know something. I don't control the remote. 
oh, I could change the channel in rebellion to God, but I don't control the remote because I'm trying to be a preacher who is submissive to what God puts upon my heart. It's just, it's totally hypo hip hypocrisy. I I'll go off to a church. They want me to come and hold a meeting. And weeks ahead of time, I I I'll call one of the elders and I'll say, hey, what would you like for me to preach on? And inevitably, they're going to say to me, oh, no, 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 you, whatever the Holy Spirit puts on your heart, because one, we do not want to get in the way of the Holy Spirit. And it's all verbiage. They'll say it, but the moment I bring up something controversial, like sending our children away for 50% of their waking hours, all of a sudden, oh, you can't go there. Why not? If God puts it on my heart, and I give you a plethora of, of passages that tell us from beginning to end that parents are responsible for training their children, then I look at our culture and recognizing that 50% of their waking hours has actually been being given over to the world, and I suggest to you, this is a problem. Why am I such a bad guy for doing that? It's sound doctrine. It's not like I'm, I'm quoting Spock or some crazy psychologist. I'm quoting the words of Scripture, and yet I've become the bad guy. As long as I talk about Islam, I'm the hero. As long as I talk about Calvinism, I'm the hero. The moment I start talking about the problems with churches having, I'm the evil guy. What's with this? It's because we're living in the last days. Notice also he says in this passage that they will gather around them. It's not just that they won't put up with sound doctrine, but they'll actually form teams. Yeah, they're, they're going to they're going to they're, they're going to form little cliques little groups, little support groups in efforts to thwart the sound doctrine. And, and so these little support groups, and they'll feed off of each other. These little support groups, they'll, they'll, they'll kind of get together, and, and, and they'll talk, and they'll gossip, and, 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 and they will, they'll do things about, oh, yes, there's this, and oh, yes, there's that. And, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a real think tank, a real think tank of, of personal viewpoints and directions, but very little Bible, if any. <laughs> These are folks who are gathering to themselves. They'll gather around them a great number of folks, but only the folks who are going to say what they want to hear. Folks, you don't learn anything by gathering to you individuals who are just going to tell you stuff that you already know or the convictions that you already have. At some point, it is legitimate for me to say we've got to grow. If you're going to grow, there's going to be some growing pains associated with that. And when you have these growing pains associated with it, you're, you can do one of two things. You can say, oh, enough of that. I don't want to feel uncomfortable because Christianity, by the way, I, I mean, I do my dues, right? I go to church twice a week, and so that's enough. And we renege on the promise that we made back in the beginning when we said that Jesus would be Lord. Folks, I'm telling you, we cannot stand before the judgment seat of God and not truly have made an effort to let him be Lord truly sacrifice so that he could be Lord. They will gather around themselves this little team, this little support group, and sometimes it's not very small. And all this little support group is all about anything that they can do to offset the sound doctrine. It's happening. Lastly, I wanted you to see this part where it says that uh, they'll gather this great number of teachers to, to say what their itching ears want to hear. There's two parts about that that I thought was interesting. The last part is this, they want to hear. But I, I, I should have circled it. But that word itching right here is, is kind of interesting. This, it's, it's something, you've had that before. It just, uh, it's, it's almost nerve right. You just can't quite get it satisfied. Well, they gather these teachers around them because they seem to feel like the only way to satisfy that itch is for them to have somebody tell them, keep doing the same thing you've been doing. They don't want anyone to say, we need to change. They're, they want folks to say what they want folks to say. When you approach Scripture from a standpoint of, hmm, I have got to prove him wrong, and so where's those passages that I can find that, that make sure that he knows that he's wrong? It's an entirely different, it's, it's the wrong approach. You don't start with a position and then go to the Bible to prove it. You start with the Bible, and then you glean your position. I, I posted recently, you know, show me, please, show me the passage that says in Scripture, indicates, implies, I'll even go there, that even implies 
that the best thing for us to do as parents is to abdicate our rights, our responsibilities to the world for 50% of our child's day. Send them off into the tutelage of the world for 50% of their waking hours each day. Show me that, just one. Just show me that passage. On the other hand, I have listed numerous passages from beginning to end that talk about parents. But I get all these nutso excuses that are thrown my way <laughs> as if I'm supposed to live my life according to the excuse, to the exception. Remember, folks, when the exception becomes the rule, it's no longer the exception. Would you say it's the exception in the world today that people keep their, or send their children away for 50% of their, their waking? Is that the exception or is that the rule? You see, what we did is, years ago, we were very much a family culture, and we recognized that families need to stick together. They, they learn together. It's that many of our great leaders in the past were homeschooled. Many of them. Many of our presidents were, presidents were homeschooled. You say, well, that's just because... Whatever! They were great men, and that's where they got their education. And what we find here is that so often, we as a culture develop, as we have, and all of a sudden we wake up, and I'm going to post a meme probably this evening right after I get done with this thing about the elephant in the room. And, you know, if you grow up with an elephant in the room, you just assume the elephant's supposed to be in the room. Well, we've had that for a couple generations now. This, ele this elephant called 50% of our waking child's waking hours, we're going to send them off into the world. That elephant has been living in our room. And we just feel like the elephant's supposed to be there. And then this crazy guy, Sonny Childs, comes along and he suggests, you know, maybe we ought to rethink this thing. Is it really healthy? Is it really a good idea? Is it not a distraction? Are we really going in the right direction? Is it really good for our purpose that we have an elephant in the room? And I'm, it's like, you're a nutso man. It's, it's like crazy. It's like you're building an ark in the backyard. They gather to themselves a team of folks who will say what they want to hear, not what God wants to say. Mmm. We're in tough times, and I am so, so discouraged by the pushback that I'm getting with regards to this subject matter. I posted this today, you know, and I, it's a legitimate question. What, what's with this? For months and months, I speak out persistently and forcefully against Islam, and I'm a hero when I do it. But the moment I make the church look into the mirror, I become the enemy. And there's, did the Lord give some kind of pass to the church? <laughs> You know, where preachers, you're not supposed to, don't talk about that one. Because so many of our people were involved in that one. So many of our people were loyal to that one. So don't talk about that one. When did the church become the standard as to what the doctrine should be? When did the community become the standard as to what the doctrine should be? When the church gets away from letting the Bible be the standard, the church is going to fall into secularism, which eventually removes, completely removes the blessing of God from us. D did the Lord give the church some kind of pass? I'm not supposed to talk about anything that the church is guilty of? I told you before that I'd really like for you to visit my YouTube channel. Please like it, become a YouTube channeler person, uh, and subscribe, I guess that's the word I'm looking, so that uh, that can you know it gets into the feed where a lot of folks will will look at it down here in the corner you also see uh hey brother sunny sunny you're probably familiar with those two websites but i got a lot a lot of resources that are available there and uh, i'd love for you to do that this is how you get to my youtube channel though and and i try to put up all these uh these uh, uh, Last Days Lives, as well as the Lord's Days Live, etc., they're on YouTube, and you can go there and you can watch them. Support that. It would really help me out a lot. All right, Last Days Survival Tip. We are about done. Um, what I did is I went to a website. You can see it up there in the top end, top corner there, the prepared.com. And uh, it, it, it had a list of, um, uh, what would you call it? Home, they, they call it a home check list summary. And if you read the introduction, uh, introduction, it was talking about, you know, it, it, the government has actually said, you know, here's some potential things on the horizon. And, and some of them, that could be terrorism, but it doesn't have to be that. I mean, they're experiencing right now on the East Coast, they're trying to dig out from underneath, you know, the hurricane of the Bahamas and all that kind of a thing. There's all kinds of horrible things that can come our, our way. Doesn't necessarily have to be persecution, although I believe that's, that's quickly coming on the horizon. But this home checklist I thought was rather really, really good. And you can find it at that website if you don't, you know, you can take pictures of this as I go through it. I think there's three slides. 
Uh, first of all, water, 15 gallons per person. Food, non-perishable, long shelf life, obviously. Uh, easy to make uh, or ready to eat. Canned goods. I think it, I like to suggest to you in your pantry that you keep canned goods. Take a, Get a Sharpie that you leave in the pantry. And on the top of it, you write the date so that you know exactly when you want to make sure that that canned goods cycles out. So that you don't have canned goods in there for 10 years. Okay, but <clears throat> you keep up with when you put it in, that kind of a thing. And you don't have to read the fine little print on the label to figure out all you, you got it right there on the top. Fire, uh, obviously, heat is very very important. Uh, light for candles, crank battery uh, powered flashlights. I did something this last trip on my way, uh, last time on my way to Louisiana. I have tried to change a tire in the darkness before, and uh, if you don't have somebody that stops along, you know, and you're not under a street light or whatever it may be, it can be almost impossible. And I got me one of those little, uh, uh, what do you call them, uh, the, the, the solar candle things that you put in your yard, you know, to mark your driveway or whatever, you may, and you can get them for, I, they're like less than $2 a piece. And yeah, I put one in my glove compartment thinking to myself, you know, if I had to do something like that, and I got a tire on my car that's kind of worn, uh, I thought, you know, I could take that out and I could at least stick that in, you know, beside me and I could have, anyhow, light's very important. Uh, the next one that we have, heat, and we already talked about that with fire a little bit, but, uh, Mostly from clothes, blankets, etc. Should you know the heat go out, you know whatever. Uh, first aid. This I thought was a rather interesting way of putting this because he didn't really answer the question. But first aid and medication. He says, see what medical experts keep in their home. Medical supplies. Individual. He says, do some research on that, which I think is a really good idea. So you know, what would a doctor if a doc? And they're bound to do this. If a doctor had a kit at home with stuff in it, what would he want in his kit? Hygiene, hand sanitizer, camp soap, etc. You see that? I think this is my third one. Um, oh, there are four of them, so get you if you're taking a picture. Communication, crank, or solar-powered radio. That's a really good one. So you can kind of keep up with the news, that, that kind of thing, whistle flares, etc. Cash, small bills, so that, you know, you never know. This thing goes south. You're able to, you're able to actually take care of some of these basic needs. Uh, bartering could easily become the system rapidly. Uh, I saw this happen several years ago when we had an ice storm that came through, and we were without power for like an eight, I don't know, eight days, something like that. But bartering, the bartering system is almost immediately put back in place. And so we, uh, even though uh, that's true, cash and that kind of thing in, in the interim is very important. Documents, I thought that was interesting. You know, copy of deeds, titles, etc. Somebody wants to argue with you about what are tools. You see what the, that's listed there with tools. <clears throat> and then the last slide, self-defense, I thought this was rather interesting. Depending on your personal views, <laughs> up to including firearms and ammo, up to and including... <laughs> Folks, we have got to get past this nonsensical assumption. That's why I wished I, you could have watched the video. A gun does not, cannot, will not kill anyone. It's the person who holds the gun, pulls the trigger, etc. It's just so nonsensical. And yet, here we got even a guy who's trying to talk about survival. Oh, man. But he says, yeah, you know, up to and including firearms and ammo. You better believe it. Then he concludes with this paragraph. Notice that this summary does not include a few things you commonly see in other emergency preparedness checklists, such as uh, we assume that you're already going to have clothing, blankets, cooking utensils, feminine hygiene products, garbage bags, soap, paper, etc., which obviously you probably uh, you probably would uh, have have within your home. But it's always a good good idea to keep a, a good supply of those things on hand, uh, so that should things go south, and they could go south rather quickly, um, you're ready. Uh, remember, uh, up until the very moment the raindrops began to fall, there were folks saying, no, no, Noah, you're out of your mind. But once the raindrops started to fall and the door was closed, they were wishing that they had a flotation device, <laughs> like a big arc, maybe. Oh, my. Uh, let's see. What else we got? I think I'm almost to my end. Yep. Conclusion. Keep your eyes on the skies, folks. Keep the family close. Keep your homemaker vigilant, keep watch on the conditions, and keep investments in heaven. Because at the end of the day, if you're good with God and your family's good with God, they can't touch you. They just can't touch you. That's why last Sunday was so very, very important to Cindy and I. Uh, that one little, little candle was lit at the front and then it began and lit up the entire room. And the application came overwhelmingly on top of me. One little light's all it takes. And the thing is, I'm not alone. I get it. Many of you who are watching support the thoughts that I'm putting forth. Yes, it's time for the church to do something different. I get that. You're with me. You got my back. You pray for me. You send me all kinds of wonderful notes. But folks, I literally grieve over the folks who I thought I knew better. 
I literally grieve over the church leaders who I thought I knew better, who are just simply sticking their head in the sand and refusing to believe that this is crunch time. They're going to answer for it. And I don't want God to have to deal with them in an unmerciful way. Please, encourage your neighbors, encourage your friends, encourage your church leaders to step up and to let Bible speak and let the Bible lead, not the popular moment in the church, not the popular moment in the community, let the Bible lead. Because these are the last days. Well, please pedal backwards and you'll see this feed. It's a guy standing at a rostrum. and he's got a microphone here. You'll see it's kind of in a political setting and uh, man, it's a powerful speech. Pedal backwards in my feed and you'll be able to find it several days ago. I love you. Stay with me. Please uh, continue to pray for me and my family. We're under it. But uh, your support means the world. Sonny Chow's, be there. Matthew 16, 26.